Welcome to Localhost. It's so good to see all of you. Um, those of you who know me, thank you so much for coming. Those of you who I don't know yet, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to talk to you about a project called Phone. Um, and uh, I think a, a great place to start is, um, who is Peter? Um, that's me. Uh, I'm in this corner, right? Hey. Uh, and if you're remote and you can't see me in the space, uh, I'll put a picture there. Um, and I was in the RC Spring 2 of 24. So that means that I started at the end of March um, and went through the end of June. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm making phone and I wanna tell you about it. Um, and so I feel like the next logical step is uh, who is phone? Um, and so phone is a phone that has no phone number. So you can only get calls from your friends. And so kind of what I want to do is bring us back to maybe a like mythological past where uh, you had a phone in your house and um, there weren't so many spam calls. And so when the phone rang, everyone was like, that's my phone, like, uh, le let me get that. And I was excited to get the phone because now we're in like a world where um, nobody ever wants to pick up the phone because uh, it's terrible. Getting calls is a terrible thing. Um, and so here's how it works. Um, we create a device that plugs into the telephone cord jack of a landline phone. Um, it connects your phone to an internet service um, so you can make calls to other such devices. Um, so if I have a phone, we can call that Peter phone. If Josh has a phone, we can call it Josh phone. I can set Josh's phone number to 1234. Um, and then uh, when I dial 1234 on Peter phone, then Josh phone rings. Um, so it sounds like a lot like a phone. Um, but the difference is that there's a private phone network. So no calls from unknown numbers. You don't actually have a phone number. And so when you get a call, you know it's from your friend. Um, sweet. Um, and this is what it looks like. Everyone's going to be so happy. We're going to be on the phone. Everyone's going to be smiling. And everyone's going to be on the phone. It's going to be amazing. Um, everyone's going to be looking in awe. It's like, what is that device? I bet it transmits your voice, and it will. Um, and so, yeah, what does phone do? Um, I wanted to break this down and kind of like take this in bits. So like, um, kind of when I started it on this project, I feel like there was like a big question, which was like, um, I don't really know how phones work. And uh, it would be really cool to get the thing to ring. Um, and so I broke it down and I was like, all right, well, what, what, what do I want the phone to do? Well, I want it to uh, ring. I want it to uh, play audio output. Uh, I want it to receive audio input. Um, and I want it to call other phones. So I was like, boom, there we go. Nice, nice checklist. Um, as I go down, we can kind of like check this. And so I put a little uh, mini map in the top right corner. Um, so you can see where we are. Um, the first one's ring, the second one's audio output. There's like some zoom overlays. So it kind of, I'm trusting. And it's a receive audio input and then call other phones. Um, sweet. Um, so yeah, the first wall I ran into is ringing. So I have like a little thing. It's like a metaphor. Um, there's going to be like a wall and I'm going to have to figure it out to get to the promised picture of uh, everybody having a great time. Um, cool. So what inputs does a phone have? Um, this was like a, the first really cool thing that I learned. I've learned a lot of really cool things. I think they're cool about phones. Um, and uh, basically the inputs that go into a landline phone are tip uh, and ring. Um, and uh, that's it. There's two wires. Uh, that go into a phone. Um, and uh, that includes things like power, that includes things like voice, that includes things like ringing. Um, all these things transit over two wires, which I think is like a really cool thing about um, landline phones. Um, and so how do you make a phone ring? This is wall number one. Um, so what you have to do is you have to send 20 hertz, which means 20 times per second, um, of 40 volts of RMS peak-to-peak uh, -peak AC signal across tip and ring. I know that's a lot of jargon. Um, but uh, basically, this is a big number. This is a big number of volts. Um, and we can kind of see that in action if I tell you how many volts the Pi can output. So I'm connecting this to a Raspberry Pi. Um, it can output 3.3 .3 to 5 volts. Uh, 40 volts RMS is like this weird, there's like square roots involved. Um, but uh, it means 60 volts peak to peak. Um, and the Pi output is much smaller than that. And so the first thing that um, I had to figure out was, OK, how can we take this um, device that can only output 3.3 to 5 volts and get this thing to output much more voltage. And I remember hopping on calls with uh, Cameron um, and being like, oh, like we have to like figure out like voltage step up and like all these like things that uh, I don't really uh, feel qualified to talk about. Um, but what it, eventually I found this thing called the Silvertel AG1171S. And I bet you're wondering what is the Silvertel AG1171S? Well, it's a slick, which is cool. Um, and uh, that stands for subscriber line interface circuit. Um, oh, interface card, sorry, uh, correction. Um, and it interfaces with POTS, which stands for plain old telephone service. Um, and it does all of the things that we want the phone to do. It implements battery feed, over voltage protection, ringing, signaling, coding, hybrid, test, 
Borscht. And this is not a joke. This is a real technical term in the land of phones. And this link takes you to an actual Wikipedia page titled Borscht that talks about landline phones, which is really great. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, making the phone ring with the Silvertel AG1171S. This thing has a few pins on it. So uh, if you can connect this thing to your Pi, um, then you have to deal with two pins. Uh, if you set the ringing mode pin high, that turns it into ringing mode. Um, and then you have to send an oscillating signal um, to this other pin called FR, which stands for forward reverse. Um, and if you do that at 20 hertz, what it does is when you send a forward signal, and so I kind of drew this other graph here, if I send a forward signal, it flips it to 60 volts output on tip and ring. Um, and it does that with this like specific curve. So it, it specifically doesn't do it immediately. Um, and it specifically has this curve here. And when you flip it back into reverse mode, it goes to negative 60 volts again with this curve. And it's kind of designed such that when you do it at 20 hertz, it roughly makes this like interesting like sinusoidal curve. Um, and so it roughly uh, approximates um, 20 hertz of this very high voltage, this negative 60 to 60, um, using two digital pins. And so what this accomplishes for us is that um, instead of a 20 hertz 120 volt signal, now we only need a 20 hertz 3.3 volt signal, which the Pi can absolutely do. So that's great. Um, and so once you have that working, um, you need to generate that 20 hertz signal. Um, I use a technique called pulse width modulation. Um, and what this does is it generates a square wave with a set frequency and a set width. And so basically pulse width modulation, you can think of as this function um, that outputs a square wave. And the two inputs to the function are the frequency and the width or the duty cycle. Um, and so if I give it a width of 50%, then 50% duty cycle means uh, it's kind of like this picture here. Um, I get a square wave where half the time it's high and half the time it's low. Right? And if I do 100% duty cycle, it's always high. If I do 0% duty cycle, it's always low. And I can do values in between. Um, but for us, we only care about making a square wave. And so we'll do a 20 hertz signal, 50% duty cycle. Um, sweet. Um, so once we have that, um, you can do this. And this is where um, I'm going to switch over to GarageBand, which is probably surprising. Um, but uh, this is for audio reasons, I promise. And we might get a slight echo, um, but that's going to be OK. Um, well, you can do this. Sweet. And let me actually set this to float on top because I wanted to do that. Um, sweet. So yeah, we can make it ring. Um, and that's using Python. It's working on the Pi. Um, and all of that's working good. Um, and so let me actually swap this out really quickly for the next demo. Spoilers. Um, sweet. Uh, so yeah, the phone rings. That's great. Um, and the next thing on the list was play audio output. Um, and so the next wall here is audio output. Here's me. I have an AG1171S uh, slick now. Um, and we're once one wall closer uh, to uh, the uh, fun. Um, so what does audio look like? I want to take some time to talk through audio just as a general concept, um, and especially how it kind of like is represented um, when we talk about audio in code. Um, so audio is a set of overlapping analog signals. And when we say analog signals, that's as opposed to digital signals. Um, digital signals are either on or off. We're typically representing them as 0 or 1. Um, and analog signals can have values in between 0 or 1. Um, and audio really cares about these kind of like uh, analog values. These fractional amplitude values are like super, super important to audio. Um, because audio is all about shapes of signals, right? And you can imagine that the difference between a circle and a square is that one of them is a circle and another one is a square. Um, so if you care about something that's a circle and you get a square, you're gonna be like, that's not a circle. Um, and that's how audio works. That's that's it in a nutshell. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just to demonstrate this a little bit, right? Um, especially when you have two pure tones, right? We can often audio, or sorry, model audio as a combination of tones as a sum of uh, different sinusoids. Um, if I have a 100 hertz pure tone and a 500 hertz pure tone, um, this leads to this more complex tone. You can overlay them on top of each other like this shows. Um, and this will give you another tone, right? Um, and you'll be able to recognize that as, oh, this is this, is this other thing. Um, and if I tried to approximate this very naively in digital, right? We could maybe say like, oh, when this thing is above zero, it's set to one. When it's below zero, we set it to zero. Um, and then we kind of get this picture, right? Um, the 100 hertz tone will be these like big rectangles, these wide rectangles like this. And the 500 hertz will be these like kind of smaller rectangles. And then it stops making sense kind of like what it means to add these things together, right? Like where in analog signals, I can add these two things and get a higher peak. In digital, because I only have kind of ones or zeros, I can like or them together maybe. I can take like the sum and then see if that's greater than one or something like that. 
Um, but the point being that the shape of this signal is very different from the shape of this signal. If I try and play this signal, it won't sound at all like this complex tone here. Um, so that is one thing that's really annoying about audio and specifically with computers. Com computers speak much more um, in the realm of digital signals. Um, they don't really speak in the realm of analog signals unless you are um, very convincing. Um, so how do I generate analog audio? Um, the way that this works is this technique called pulse width modulation. You may have heard about it. Um, and so we generate a square wave with a frequency and a width. Um, and uh, five volts, so this is the kind of twist on it. Um, if I say five volts at a width of 50%, um, we can kind of think of that as two and a half volts. And so we can kind of get a, pl a place that's kind of in between zero and one, right? Um, and the idea here is that if my frequency is really, really high, um, then the uh, phone doesn't have time to react. And when you send it a 25% duty cycle, it's like, oh, that's an average voltage of 25%. Um, and so you end up with this uh, kind of like line if, you, if I sense the signal on this graph. Um, and this kind of in, assumes that you're working at a pretty high um, frequency. So ignore this five hertz. You need something a lot faster than that. Um, but roughly you can kind of get this average voltage. Um, and the idea is that then you can take these uh, kind of analog values, translate them into um, values between zero and five volts, and then output that using this pulse with modulated thing. So even though under the hood, this thing is actually sending out digital signals, it's only ever high or low. Um, the idea is that the average voltage that the, that the uh, device sees is something that behaves kind of like analog. Um, and so this sort of approximation is called bit banging, um, and we can ignore that part. Um, so the issue is that audio is a real piece of work um, in a lot of ways that I've been describing. Um, but one of the things is that audio playback and recording is relatively high frequency. We're talking about tens of kilohertz here. Um, and uh, audio playback recording is uh, sensitive to the regularity of samples, right? So the way that audio is typically um, output and input when it comes to uh, computers is that um, computers can't really output like a contiguous signal. Um, and so what you do is you take samples and you say like every, I don't know, like one in 44,000 uh, seconds, um, figure out what the analog value is right now, um, and then do that every single sample, and then put those together and play them back at the same sample rate that it was recorded at. If you play it back at a different sample rate, um, then it'll sound slow or it'll sound fast. Um, and so that very that regularity of the samples and the frequency of the samples becomes a very uh, relevant parameter when you're talking about audio here. Um, and so this is kind of an illustration to show you what's going on. If I had an audio signal that looked like this, and I sampled it at these regular intervals like this, Right, And I played it back, even if I had the same values in these samples, if I don't have it at that same frequency and I don't have it at that same regularity, I end up with a very different shape to the signal. And like I was saying before, shape is extremely important in, in audio. Um, and so this thing will sound very, very different. Right, um, And so this is a problem that we need to solve. Um, so uh, if we're playing back at 48 kilohertz, um, which is the sampling rate that I was using, um, that gives us 20.83 microseconds per pair of sample. Um, and application code in the Pi, especially a Python script like what I was using, has a really hard time keeping up with that. Um, and application code in the Pi has a really hard time keeping up with that regularly. And so the question is, what do we do? Um, and so we use this thing called device tree overlays, and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, I'm not an expert. I don't really know what they are. Um, but they basically let me trick the Pi into thinking that three of the pins are a headphone jack. And so one of the pins ends up being left channel, one of the pins ends up being right channel, and the other pin ends up being ground. Um, and if you look at like your headphone, if you have a, I mean, I'm Apple killed them, but if you have like a three and a half millimeter jack, um, it has these three kind of separated uh, spots. And one of them is left channel, one of them is right channel, one of them is ground. And you can actually like wire up wires to them and play things and it will go through um, your headphones and it's really cool. Um, that was something that I used to, to test this as I was building this out as well. Um, and so uh, if I do that, then Pi, the Pi wants to be able to play things via headphones. And so it already has these tools um, for playing audio. And then the Pi has, I don't know if they're drivers or what exactly you would call them, but the Pi has functionality built into it that will do that big bang for me. Um, and so they look like this. Uh, it says DT overlay, and then there's like a lot of these like magic uh, words. Um, and I, it's not, uh, yeah, you know, it sent it to like which, which pins um, it enables the jack. Um, and there you go, that's all you need to know. Um, and then you can do this. Um, so let's do, turn this one on. And then what we can do is this. Get rid of this. Oh. <laughs> And for the people on remote, let me.
Yeah. All right. So that's uh, audio output. Um, so we got uh, audio output. Um, and the, the next step was receive audio input. Um, and so here I am. I got my DT overlay now. And one more wall. Um, so analog to digital conversion, this is the results, uh, or sorry, the reverse direction of what we were just talking about. Um, so this is converting from those wobbly float signals to a binary digital signal. Um, and some microcontrollers have built in input to do this, but uh, not our Pi, unfortunately. And this is kind of a graphic showing what's going on. So we have these kind of intermediary values. Um, and basically what it needs to do is take this value that's maybe like half of the maximum um, and translate that into a value on some bit range. Um, so this is an 8-bit signal um, in this example. Um, and this is going to translate to half of that range. And this next signal is me maxing it out. And so it maxes it out like this. And the next signal is maybe like three quarters of the way. So just like or something around three quarters. This next signal is small. And so it does something smaller. And so this is kind of the translation that we need to do, right? So taking each of these samples and turning them into a sequence of, of these uh, digital values. Um, and so in order to do this, I tried using the MCP3008, which is like one of the chips that comes up when you look up ADC. Um, this is a 10-bit analog to digital converter. Um, it uses a protocol called SPI, um, and don't use this for audio. Um, it does not work. Um, all that sampling frequency and regularity stuff um, has to get handled by the chip. Um, the chip meaning, or isn't handled by the chip, and so it has to get uh, handled by the Pi. And we've seen in the past that the Pi does not like working at those frequencies. Um, and so instead, we talk about the Texas Instruments PCM1802, um, which you can see has many more leggies, um, which is like a nice uh, analog to just be like, oh, this is a complicated chip. It probably does more things. Um, and so this is a 24-bit analog to digital converter. Um, it speaks a different protocol called I squared S um, and allows specifying a sampling frequency based on an external clock. So you feed it in a clock signal, um, and then it can basically translate that into some sampling frequency. I mean, I won't go too far into the details, but basically I can tell it, hey, I want to be able to sample at 48 kilohertz, and it will kind of uh, deal with that for me, and we'll handle kind of like buffering that, and it will send that along into my Pi using that, uh, that protocol I squared S. Um, and because this is an audio specific chip, um, it handles a lot of the common audio sampling rates, 16 kilohertz, 44.1 is the CD one and 48 kilohertz as well. Um, cool, so the PCM1802 is great, but it's also a real piece of work. All those legs mean business and all those legs need really specific inputs. Um, it only came in surface mount format, which is really annoying. Um, I hand soldered this, please admire it. Um, and look up solder paste videos, they're very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And so I use solder paste. Look at that. It like, it like bloops up. It's really cool. Um, and I did this um, at a NYC resistor. And there's a ghost. Be careful. Um, but I did this at New York City resistor, which is right around the corner. And um, yeah, thank you, resistor, for, for uh, allowing me to come through on craft night. Um, if you have electronics projects and you want to check out resistor, please do. Um, sweet. Um, and thank you, Josh, for going with me. Um, and so uh, the issue is that the application code in the Pi has a hard time keeping up. Um, the application code in the Pi is really hard time keeping up regularly. Um, so what do we do? Device tree overlays. Um, and this time, there's no out of the box overlays. So we have to write and compile our own. Um, and this I was working with Jesse a lot on. And at some point, we were like, Jesse, you're, you're Jesse's uh, dad knows some stuff about Linux and device tree overlays. So we asked for his advice. Um, we got this really good advice here. Um, and so we knew we were off to a really good start. Um, we knew that we were, we were uh, looking at some really good stuff. Um, so yeah. Here's the device tree overlay source. Um, I'm not going to explain too much here, um, but look, it says I squared S, which matches our chip. Um, it says stereo two channels and it says 32 bit. I said the chip was 24 bit. We'll get into that if we have time, um, but 32 bits the right value here. Um, and so you can see there's some things that you can do here. And I'm not sure about the stereo. I think that's right. Um, but yeah, if you do that, then you can do this. You're like, hello? Oh. Jesse. Jesse, Jesse, Je Jesse, Jesse, Jesse is recording. Jesse is recording. <laughs> and uh Uh that was yeah, that was the first ever recording that we had out of um a telephone, which was really cool. Um I was like, Jesse, this is what Alexander Graham Bell feels like. Um like, this is a, this is a blast in the past. Um and it feels really good. You probably you must have felt really great. Um cool. And so what does the phone do? It uh, rings, it plays audio output, it receives audio input. Um, and so now we just have to call other phones via buttons, last step. Um, and so here's dialing. I have my PCM1802. Um, we threw that other chip out. I, it's not even in the picture. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk to you a little bit how uh, phones uh, work. Um, this is how rotary phones work. It's called pulse dialing. 
Um, and the way that this works is it encodes each tone to a number of pulses. And the way that those pulses work is they actually, and this is a really cool thing. Remember, this thing only has two inputs, right? It has a uh, tip and ring. And um, one of the signals that it transmits is um, whether the phone is on the hook or whether the phone is off the hook. And the way that actually works is that when the phone is picked up, it actually completes a circuit. And when you put the phone down, phones are designed such that it actually breaks a circuit. So there's like a mechanical element in there that actually breaks whatever circuit is going to your telephone system. Um, and so pulse dialing actually makes uh, use of that. What it does is it encodes each tone to a number of pulses. So one is one pulse, two is two pulse, zero is 10 pulses. Um, and basically what it does is it uh, sends that number of pulses at a specific frequency. Um, and it's very cool stuff, it's very hacker friendly. So this is a clip from a movie called Hackers. Um, and this is demonstrating um, uh, basically how you can uh, use this to your advantage. So this person is making a call and what they do is that you see them bouncing up the, the on-hook signal. Um, and this was a real technique that you could use. Um, and it was a way to like get around things like long distance calling um, by just dialing a number using the uh, actual hang up hook of the phone that you were using. Um, so you could put in your number by just like pushing in these like pulses. Um, and then that would translate to the phone. The phone like literally can't tell a difference, right? Cause um, it's an analog, syst analog system. Um, it's really hard to DRM an analog system that's simple. Um, so uh, yeah, really, really cool and really hacker friendly, very sweet. Um, and so that's rotary phones. That's how rotary phones work. Um, why is it just playing the clip again? Can we go to the next slide? Okay, sweet. Um, and then uh, after rotary phones uh, kind of came and went, uh, we moved on to this other system um, in touch tone phones called dual tone multi-frequency signaling or DTMF for short. Um, and so each tone gets encoded to two sinusoids. So you can see in this chart here, one is a sum of 697 plus 1209 Hertz, um, two is 697 plus 1336 and so on. Um, the original spec actually has these like A, B, C, D, but you don't see these a lot. And so we're very used to kind of this three by four grid here. And these are the most common ones. Um, and it turns out these are very sensitive to pitch, right? So you see between here and here, you only really have a difference of like 70 Hertz to work with, right? If we're even like, if we're like 10 Hertz off, then all of a sudden, like we, we won't really be picking up these tones when they're playing. Um, and uh, the question is like, how can we uh, do this? The, uh, in practice, what we use, um, you might be thinking um, if you're familiar with kind of like uh, signal processing, you might be thinking of like an FFT. Um, I use this thing called the Gertzel algorithm. Um, it's this magical uh, algorithm. I don't really know why it works. Um, it's a special case of this discrete Fourier transform. And basically what it does is it lets you detect um, the existence of a known frequency, right? And so if I am like, hey, I wanna know specifically if 500 Hertz is happening in this audio signal, if you pass it through this algorithm, that 500 Hertz signal will have a very high magnitude. And so basically you can do a lot of thresholding and some other um, kind of like clever logic um, to see like, okay, like is a 500 Hertz present? Um, you can give yourself a yes or a no. And then what we do is we take these seven known frequencies that we have that make up DTMF, pass that through a bunch of Gertzel um, processes, and then we can figure out if, if any of those tones exist or how many of them exist as well. Um, and this was a great excerpt that I found as I was researching this stuff. Um, and when I saw this, it says, as you can see, the GERTS algorithm deserves to be added to your signal processing toolbox. And uh, it's so true. It does, and it is. Um, and so, um, yeah, once you do that, you can do this. Uh, this is a little clunky to demo because I have to like pull up some stuff. Um, so here's a graph in lieu of a demo. Basically, what I did is I took an audio uh, input using a phone um, that was now working. And I translated that into a wave file. And what I did was I ran the Gertzel uh, algorithm on the samples in that wave file. And you can see these green bars are basically the tones that I detected. And so you can see what I had done is I uh, picked up the phone and I recorded the audio that happened when I just pressed the numbers one through zero. Um, maybe I even include star and pound, um, but you can see that as I press the numbers, they, the Gertzel process was detecting each of those in, in, in sequence. Um, cool. Okay, great. Um, so now we can input numbers on rotary and touch tone phones. That's really good. Um, so now we can just send out a request to the phone network. Um, if you flash back a little bit, um, I was saying this is a private phone network. There's no calls from unknown numbers. Um, and it connects the phone to the internet. Um, and so that's fine. That's fine. We're okay. Um, but we need to figure out the internet. Um, and so now I have my signals processing toolbox. That's going to come in handy for sure. Um, but you see like the mini map has gotten a little bit more complex. Um, we need to figure out what's going on that'll lead us to internet. Um, and then maybe we can dial phones. Um, so we have, I, I had a little box. We, we should still count, count score, keep score for us. We, we should give ourselves a point for, for number detection. Um, and so cool. Uh, how do I connect my landline to the internet? Um, well, Wi-Fi. Um, okay, that's really good. The Raspberry Pi can connect to Wi-Fi. All I need is the Wi-Fi credentials. Um, but uh, 
with a Raspberry Pi, the Wi-Fi credentials are typically embedded in the OS image. And what that means is that that's great if I just want to set it up to work in one Wi-Fi network. But if I want to be able to like take it home and like have it on my Wi-Fi network, I need to change those credentials somehow. Um, and so uh, phones have great user interface for it. We're fine. We're fine. We're like so good. Um, they have buttons. They have rotary dials. They have speakers. They have microphones. You can hang them up. Uh, they don't have a keyboard. They don't have a mouse. They don't have a display. Um, this isn't actually very good for putting in Wi-Fi credentials. So we need to figure out a way to do this. Um, so we have buttons, like buttons are kind of like keyboards, um, but buttons only has numbers, but also has Sextile and Octothorpe, so that's good. Um, uh, we can use T9, like T9 was something that we had. So like, if you remember this thing, right, we have like letters on numbers um, and that lets us map from numbers to letters, that's cool. Um, but Wi-Fi SSIDs and passwords can have things like big letter, and symbol, um, which like isn't on here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I had to like build T9++, um, or at least not had to, had to strong. Um, and so letters are the same as T9, the lowercase letters are. Um, you can mode switch with one. Um, and uh, basically that mode that you can use is lowercase, uppercase, symbol, and then number. And so that covers all the things that um, SSIDs can use at least like on some on some level, I, I, I got the feeling that most of them use like the visible range of ASCII. Um, if you're using Unicode in your Wi-Fi network, I'm sorry, I can't really help you. Um, but symbols have a custom mapping and I built that. And so um, hi looks like capital H, one, four, four. So uppercase, then four, four. Lowercase i is four, four, four. And the exclamation mark is one, two. Um, and it's like, cool, these are numbers. So even rotary phones can do this, which is a really sweet part of this project. Um, now here's the problem. Um, that's like a lot of buttons. Uh, if you've used a rotary phone before, um, which isn't a guarantee at this point, um, they're kind of like a pain to like put a lot of numbers into. Um, and even on a touchtone phone, that's still a lot of buttons to hit. Um, that's too many buttons. Is there another way we can do it without so many buttons? And the answer is yes, it's called freaking. Um, and so if I have no mouse, but I must scream, um, buttons transmit signal via tones. Remember, this is a two line system. There's only ring and tip. Um, and what that means is that even audio signals transit over those two wires. And so it doesn't know if those audio tones aren't coming from me actually hitting the button, right? The, what the phone is doing is it's actually producing an audio signal um, that matches DTMF. Um, so what I can do is play a tone into the mic that is equivalent to pressing a button. This is often referred to as freaking. Um, and if I play the tones that correspond to my T9++ encodings, then uh, I have buttons sans buttons. Um, and so what I built, um, and let me show you this, uh, is this. Well, first, there's a few things that I want to demo here. Um, let me make sure that uh, Sandstorm isn't playing. I think we're fine. Cool. Um, so if I run this on, what's like a fun phone that I like? Let's try the rotary phone. Um, here we go. Great. Let's do it ring. So it knows that the network is unreachable. Um, and if I pick up the phone, right, it's like, hey, the phone got picked up with no Wi-Fi. And I can show you a couple things here. So if I do like this and I dial like this, I can type H. And if I dial like this, I can type I. And if I dial like this, I can get an exclamation mark maybe. Right? And so I can type on this thing, yeah. <laughs> And so we can do that on um, this touchtone phone as well. Ow, that's hot. Um, hopefully that's okay. Um, if I put this here, that one rings too. That's really cool. I mean, it also knows the network is unreachable. And so what I can do is I can use the buttons here and I can do like, uh, hi. Look, it does that too. And so we have buttons. That looks good. Um, and the issue is that like uh, the Reeker Center is a very secure place. There's like a lot of characters in the uh, Wi-Fi network. And so I don't really want to um, do all of that. Um, but what I can do instead is, uh, let me just restart this because it's, you know, who knows, maybe it's a little buggy. Um, and uh, what I built here um, is uh, a little web app. Um, this is um, all HTML. Give this a second to load it. it my thing's a little laggy here. Um, you know, we, we're learning how browsers work, you know, like and how they render and all that. Um, but uh, I can put in like the Recurse Center credentials in here. 
Um, and what this does um, is it translates all of that to uh, those signals that I was talking about. So um, while I type this in, and then while I wait for this to kind of catch up, um, basically what this app does, is it takes your um, SSID and your password, and it translates them into a DTMF tones, which is something that's super useful um, and super important. Um, and once you have that, uh, you can connect to Wi-Fi. So here's what I'll show you is uh, right now I have this uh, process. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but basically what it's doing is it's checking to see if uh, the port for this Raspberry Pi is on the network. And so um, that's this in this terminal window here. Um, the way that we know to cheer is it says connection to port 22 is successful. And it's not doing that yet, so don't cheer yet. Um, and so uh, right now this phone isn't on the network, right? this Raspberry Pi. And what that means is I can't even SSH to it, right? It's like completely isolated. And so if I do this, um, using the uh, Wi-Fi credentials, and I'm going to shut up for a second. Check it out. And if we look up here, we succeed. Cool. So now we can connect to Wi-Fi. That's really great. And we have this sweet website that does it. That website's HTML, semantic HTML, really great. A shout out to Alex Petras. Um, sweet. Uh, there's one div in this entire thing. It, and and I, 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 you know, it's really great. We love it. Um, anyway, uh, so what does the phone do? Um, it uh, calls other phones via buttons. Uh, we can receive button or rotor inputs. That's really cool. Transit them to text. It connects to Wi-Fi. That's all really cool. Uh, and the last one is it dials other phones. We're in the home stretch. Um, so here we are. We got a SIP server. Um, and uh, I decided I was going to go around this one. Uh, this is like a lot to, to take in. Um, but I do have this T9++ thing up here. Um, and so instead, what I did was I built a SIP client. That's a little bit easier. And it's a wall that's a little bit more um, doable. And so uh, the question you might be asking to yourself is, what is SIP? Um, so SIP is called, is it stands for Session Initiation Protocol. Um, it's the de facto standard for negotiation negotiating communication sessions between clients. Um, and it looks like this. So uh, basically what this does is if I'm a caller, I send this invite request to the callee. The callee then says like, hey, that's cool, I'm trying. Um, and then it starts its ringing process and says, hey, I'm ringing. And then if someone picks up, then it sends back this like, okay response. I send back an act and then you're talking and you're talking, you're having a great time. Um, and then when you hang up, it sends this buy and it sends back a 200 okay. There's like a little bit more complexity here, but this is basically a, a very representative picture of what SIP uh, typically looks like. Um, and this doesn't actually transmit voice protocols, right? This is typically done by a different uh, protocol called real-time transfer protocol. Um, so SIP is kind of like the envelope around the voice signal um, and kind of like the negotiation of like how you want to handle that RTP protocol because there's a lot of different um, like codecs and things you can use, a lot of configuration that the clients can figure out between themselves. Um, but SIP is kind of like that wrapper. Um, cool. So um, I use this tool called Asterisk. Uh, this is not a correction or an addendum. This is the name of the out-of-the-box SIP server that I'm using. Um, it's cool, but it's really complex, and the configuration isn't like super, super interesting. So I'll spare you the details. I have an I have like an appendix that uh, talks a bit about the configuration here. Um, but the coolest part about it is that I didn't have to build it. Um, and then the other coolest part about it is that it's running on RC3, which is uh, in the hub. Um, thank you to Clint, Greg, and Ian for putting that up. Um, and yeah, it's all it's all running on the private network, so that's really really cool. Um, here's Astro's logo. It's there. Um, and then yeah, all I had to do was build a SIP client. So now I have a SIP server running. Um, I have SIP clients, and I did in fact build this one. But Astro does have client side code. Um, it's cool. It's fun. It has a lot of rust that I'm fairly proud of. But again, it's like kind of like a lot of detail, so I won't go too deep into it. Um, and then you can do this. All right, let me hook these up. Um, hopefully the fact that it was really hot before is not actually a problem. Um, well, yeah, if I like hook this phone up and I hook this phone up, what was your number? 1102 and you are 1101, great. Um, if I start up this, Thing looks good. Then I can pick up the phone and be like, hey, who do you want to call? Don't say it. Um, one, one, zero, two. Come on now. Wait, let's give it one more try. 
Why am I not getting a dial tone on you? That's not good. This is why we have backup pies. So you might not be able to watch me type this one. Oh yeah, there's a dial tone. Hey, hello. Oh, oh I see what happened. <laughs> Where does this go? All right, we're gonna use a different phone. We're gonna use another phone. We're using another phone. We're using a different phone. <laughs> all right where is it one one zero two why are you connected to this why all these wires are messed up are you one one zero one oh i'm all i'm all mixed up now all right let's try a different phone number no it doesn't like that one all right all right all right give me one second here we're going to swap this out for this one come on We're ready for market. Let's uh, reboot this really quick. Give me a minute. I'll try and think of a joke in the meanwhile. Let me just see if I can plug this in. It's over here. Don't do a hardware project. The demo's going really poorly. This is a really great um, this is a really great hit rate for my demos, honestly. I haven't had one work yet. And I, I got like a bunch of them working this time. So. No dial tone on you. All right. I'm gonna reboot these. There we go. Here we go. Look. I'm coding, <laughs> I'm hacking. Yeah, that was all me. I know it's very tiny. I, uh, if you're on Zoom and you're worried that you're missing something, I promise I didn't actually write that. That's that was a joke. Um, but yeah, once this thing boots up, we should hear them ring, um, which is a nice little signal that it's working. Oh, I didn't plug this in. All right, we're gonna plug this into this one. It's too many wires, you're swapping it out was too much. Okay. Good, good. I like ordered these up here. One would think that it'd be like one, two, three, or like one, two, three. Um, I have it as a one, two, three right now, which is like very confusing to me. I shouldn't have done that. Um, so yeah, we're gonna wait for Raspberry Pis to boot up. They're a little bit slow. They're a little bit weak, but they're a lot of fun. Look, we can like admire the picture here. This is Al. There's Jesse, there's me, there's Manny. Yeah. And we're having such a good time on phones. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, so, so, you know. Hey, they're coming online, they're coming online. <laughs> we got a dial tone? We do. That one's online. Does that mean that I can, what do you, what do you say? Ah, uh, you're not gonna tell me anything. Uh, one, one. Zero is really annoying to do on this thing. I'm gonna use this one. You got Delta? Nice. I got a busy tone. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> so yeah, I think um, if we could have seen logs of all that, that would've been really cool, but hey, they ring. And I do promise, I, I wonder if, is this one also unplugged? Is that what's going on with this? Ah. 
So like these these connectors are um, a little bit different. I mean, this is awful joking. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. But uh, these connectors are really tall, tiny, and they're actually different from the telephone connectors, and they're very fragile. And so these break, and then they fall out of these sockets all the time. It's very annoying. Look at that. I get a dial tone now. That's awesome. So let's try this one again. No. All right, fine. It's fine. It's fine. They talk to each other. It's great. It's really cool. They work. They totally work. They totally work. They totally work. Um, sweet. Um, but yeah, uh, that's 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 uh, the book of what I had for you today. Um, I want to give a massive thank you to a whole bunch of people, Jesse, um, so many things. Um, I mean, like you were like a intellectual partner in all sorts of stuff and the source of information and uh, just like knowledge for so many things. It's incredible. Um, Jeremy for like talking me down. I was really mad at Rust. Um, Aurora for helping me with this web app um, and also buying me a ton of phones. Well, buying me is a strong word. Um, they were on the street, um, but finding them for me, which is really great. Um, Josh for throwing me out, showing me around the harbor resource at the hub, going to um, Resistor with me, sending me off with the phone. Paolo for brainstorming a VoIP software. Amy for being the inspiration for all of these landline phone things at the hub. If you notice, there's one on the wall, which isn't actually me. Um, that one is Amy and Josh. Um, and there's also a cool project to talk to Josh about it. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about it. Um, Greg for all his encouragement and inspiration um, and constantly telling me that I should just take the easy way out, which is actually super, super helpful advice a lot of the time. Um, Finn and the RC staff are putting this all together. I'm sorry I got sick. Um, that was a bummer. Um, Joachim for all this production stuff that I don't really get, like this lamp came out of nowhere. I just like came to the hub and it was just here. Um, Dan for AV. Um, Manny for photography and Resistor for craft nights. Um, and of course, RC, thank you so much um, for having me, giving me the space. Um, it's amazing. amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so now uh, I believe that we're moving to QA. Is that right, Finn? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Let me just see. I, chat has like 99 messages in it. Yeah. I don't know how to like. Can you moderate chat? So maybe I'll just like point at people in the audience. I do have like appendices as well, if people want to see those. Um, but I'm happy to maybe like answer like three questions, do an appendix, and then see how we feel. Sweet, yeah. Um, but yeah, anybody have any one questions you want to ask? Yeah? Is that you, Jordan? OK, hi. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so Jordan's question was, um, I was talking about how I was using these like Linux sound subsystems to uh, output onto uh, the, the phone. And the question was, how do uh, those audio signals make it onto the two wire tip and ring connection? Um, and that is something that uh, is handled by the slick itself. So that's that chip that I was showing you. Um, basically, uh, there are separate inputs um, in addition to outputs. So one of the things that the slick does is it breaks out your outputs. Um, and so if the phone is on the hook or off the hook, there's a digital signal for that. Um, if the phone is uh, has has audio playing on it, there's a different signal for that. And also breaks out your inputs, right? So ringing was one of them um, that's broken onto two different pins. Um, and audio is another. So there's a V in pin um, that if you send an analog signal in, um, then it will play it through the speaker. Um, and that one is is mono. And so I only use the the left side of a headphone channel for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great question. Um, is there one from chat that I should field? Ava. Ava, um, as you saw, it's um, a little bit buggy, um, but uh, you'll be one of the first to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another one in the room or chat. Sweet. Then yeah, I can talk through like an appendix. There were some really cool things that um, I wasn't sure if I would have time to talk about that are really, really sweet. So I kind of showed you um, sort of like the critical path for development. Um, but there were some like really, really cool rabbit holes I went down. Um, and maybe I'll start with one. It's the last appendix. So I'm going to have to do a lot of this. Um, and look, there's like a lot of really cool stuff I can talk about. Um, and we, we maybe will. But I want to talk about this one. Um, this was one that I was working out with Jeremy, actually. Uh, was it yesterday, Jeremy? It was like a couple of days ago? I don't know. Yeah, was it literally yesterday? Um, but it was talk we, were, we were going through repairing of the rotary phone ringer. So you might have noticed during the talk, um, this ringer is a very healthy ringer. It sounds nice and loud. It like will totally let you know when you're getting a call. Um, but it wasn't always that way. Um, so this phone is uh, actually from the 60s. Um, I bought this thing from Big Reuse, which is like a big uh, stuff with a lot of reusable things. Um, it's like a big warehouse you can buy things from. Um, and it's called the Western Electric 500DM. Um, apparently, these were all the rage in the 50s. 
Um, and uh, it had some problems. It didn't have a handset, which is why it's this funny two-tone thing. Um, it had broken like telephone jacks. So you see like the telephone jack on the back here is white. Um, it's full of dust bunnies. Um, it was a very sad and quiet ring. And I was like, dang, that's gonna be a bummer when it comes to presentations. And so we cracked this thing open and I looked at the ringer um, and it was actually this like really, really interesting system. So I opened this thing up. This is what happened. You can just like take the case off of it. And it looks like this. this is a picture of this phone. Um, and you can see uh, kind of like a little bit of how this thing works. There's this like hammer um, that goes through the middle of these two bells. And when you run uh, the right sort of signal through this, um, that hammer goes back and forth and it just rings these two bells um, in theory. It wasn't really doing that super well. Um, and so what we were seeing was that this hammer was kind of glued to this left bell and it would kind of like every once in a while get like a little bit of a signal to like get off of that bell and like hit it really softly. Um, but it wasn't doing that super, super uh, uh, loudly or like super, super reliably. Um, and so what you'll notice if you look at the side view is there's this like little bar here and I want to show you a different angle of that. There's this like little bar here um, that sticks out of this like, so there's this metal plate with this like, uh, with the bell on the end of it. And there's these two weird like wires here. I hope you can see my cursor. Oh, you can, great. Um, and so uh, you can see this bar and, and th these like weird bars here. And it so turns out that um, this uh, bent one is actually intentionally bent. You see they're both bent. Um, and this tiny one is actually a spring. And so this is a bias tension spring. Um, this is a, a picture that I grabbed from classicrotaryphones.com slash forum. And um, this is a, 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 an actual like mechanical thing that slots into this like weird little maze. Um, and the way that this maze works is if you bend the spring in a certain way, you can adjust the tension and pull that hammer away from the bells. Um, and that helps center it. And then I don't really know what's going on with this thick rod. We like never found out um, kind of what that was named. Um, but uh, I found that as I bent it further out of shape, it like made the uh, hammer wiggle more. So I think what it's doing is it's taking whatever input from the motor or whatever is going on in there um, and actually introducing an intentional imbalance into the system so that uh, when it receives whatever signal, it actually like wiggles and wobbles a lot more and that makes a louder or more pronounced ring. Um, and so basically went into this thing um, and it wasn't like an issue with a capacitor blown out or anything like that. It was a purely mechanical thing. I uh, just took a set of pliers, just like bent the crap out of these two wires um, and it started working really, really good. So that was really, really interesting and really, really cool to see. Um, so yeah, that's the ringer. Um, should I do like another appendix? Do we have, yeah, yeah. More, you more appendix? <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, I, let's, uh, I don't know. Let's see what, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so the phone number mapping actually happens on right now on the SIP server. And so part of the configuration of the SIP server um, is that you tell it what clients are available. And then uh, each client actually knows. So you'll notice that when I was running, let me actually see if I can pull that command back up. Um, and don't look too closely because I don't have great OPSEC here. But um, yeah, so you'll notice that in here, I give it the SIP server address um, and I give it the username and the password. And that username you can see maps directly to the phone number. Um, you can have those two things be different, um, but for me, I just mapped the username to the phone number. Yeah, and so in in a real world scenario, you would find some way to like update your SIP server and have it understand that, and your clients would would have to have an understanding of what their username was as well. Yeah, um, yeah, cool. Is there a next? If I ask what's next? Yeah, actually, that's one of my appendices. So funny you should ask. Uh, let's take a look. Um, let me take the let me make this thing stop floating on top. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, future work. So um, this is kind of like a disorganized bit of thoughts, um, but I would love to uh, do conference calls, do voicemail. I think like step one is probably like make it work better. Um, so that's gonna be a thing. Um, I'm not really sure why it doesn't work better right now um, and we'll have to figure that out. Um, but security would be really good. Um, yeah, there's uh, TLS is uh, a feature that SIP can uh, support. Um, NAT handling and public internet. I can talk about a bit of NAT stuff. Um, that's also one of my appendices here. Um, but right now it's really relying on being on the same private network um, because uh, dealing with the public internet um, and if you've ever used like port forwarding or like Hamachi in the past, like that is a huge uh, pain. Um, I, would, I need to build out like a management web app if I do want it to be something where you can like add friends and things like that. I love to do sh a, a chassis for this chip. Like it's, uh, I don't like that it got hot, that, that was bad. 
Um, but like uh, at least having it not so exposed would make it so I'm not constantly worried that's like shorting against anything. Um, and I'd love to learn like 3D printing for that. Um, that'd be really cool. Um, and I'd love to just do a V2 PCB. So what you'll notice is that this is not actually a pie if you know what a pie looks like. The pie is actually like kind of like on the bottom of this. Um, and uh, there's a few different things that I'd love to do, but I'd love to just give it some space. Um, like right now, this is the pie that I'm using for display. And like the HDMI port is like very snug and it basically has to press in because I didn't think about the fact that you want it actually like spaced out a little bit to make room for ports. Um, so that's what's improved headers here. I'd love to integrate the slick. You see it like kind of pokes out like this fin. Um, I'd love to kind of, no, nothing against fins, um, but like um, it's like one of these things that's just, uh, I would love to like, have this kind of flush with the rest of the board and have that be like a unified component. Um, I'd love to use an integrated sock instead of a Raspberry Pi, instead of being like a hat, like have like a single board, which would be really cool. An indicator LED would be great. Um, sweeter silk screens would be good. Silk screens are these like things that you can put on the board um, that like you can like write and draw. And I have this really great recurse logo on this board, but it's covered up by this chip because I didn't think through what it would look like with the chip on it. Um, so yeah, fixing that would be really cool. Um, so I have some ideas, yeah. Um, but making it work, I should, probably should have uh, put in a bullet point as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Question from chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, Reed asks. I read. First demo of the DMTF app was hit or miss. Today it was all hits. Did you do stuff to fix that? And how does all this relate to baseball? Yeah. Um, everything um, relates to baseball. Yankees are current. Rich, what's the score of the Yankees game right now? Yeah, I'll give him a second and I'll answer like the less important part of the question. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually, that's a great question, Reed. I spent a ton of time actually um, tuning um, this DTMF detection. It's actually something that, like I was saying, is like very, very uh, sensitive to frequency. Um, and what that meant was like in a noisy room, like not even in a very noisy room, like even with like the ambient like fan noise and stuff, it wasn't working during presentations. Um, and so uh, I actually had to build out like an entire testing suite or, like, or framework for myself. Um, where basically I could take like a, a recording from the phone, save that to a wave file, and then play that back um, into my Gertzel algorithm code um, so that I could tune a bunch of parameters. So like I said, it's a lot of like, honestly, fairly simple thresholding code. Um, and so uh, there's like a few different parameters that I kind of gave myself. There's like a very simple like magnitude threshold. There's like a relative threshold compared to like a measure of background noise and things like that. And I just spent like a week just like grinding on uh, getting these um, kind of recordings that felt like fairly representative. Like I intentionally chose um, noisy recordings that I expected to happen in this presentation um, and tried to get it to work there and it was working pretty good. And then uh, once I had that and it was kind of working across all of those uh, test wave files, uh, I knew I was, I was feeling pretty good. Yeah. Um, sweet. Yeah, is that, is that it, Finn? Yeah. Great. Baseball. Yeah, wait, Rich, what's the score? No score in the second. All right, we're okay. We're okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.